Good afternoon and welcome to today's live stream here on DreamBank's Facebook page. My name is Andy Frisky. I'm a senior dream curator at DreamBank. And I'd like to welcome everybody who is tuning in today. Uh, thank you so much for that. For those of you who it might be your first time, uh, an extra welcome. A little bit of context as to who we are and why we are here. So DreamBank is a free community resource that is put on by American Family Insurance. We're located in the heart of Madison, Wisconsin, right on the East Washington Corridor. And everything that we do ladders up to the inspiration and pursuit of dreams. So in large part, when we're not under a pandemic, we host right around 40 free events a month in our space, with 11 different event series, anything ranging from uh, business related, such as the event that we have today. Uh, we also have um, an inspiration, motivational and wellness speaker series, fitness related activities, family related activities. We have events in Spanish. Um, so really try to cover the gamut and appeal to as many different dreamers as possible. You're probably watching this video on our Facebook page. And uh, if you're curious about some of the offerings that we've been putting out, go ahead and press that events tab. You get a good idea, a good snapshot as to what we've been doing since about the end of March. And then also uh, you can go ahead and look forward to some of the upcoming events that we have uh, the rest of this month and later this year. We have a really cool program that we're championing. It's a dream coaching program in which people can go ahead and attend an initial intake event and then apply to receive coaching from the dream curators on their goals or dreams. Really cool project. Very excited about unveiling that. Put a lot of time and effort into that. So if you are interested, keep an eye out for that. Without further ado, though, I would like to go ahead and introduce our featured speaker, Angela Prestel. So as a senior consultant for CU Difference, Angela brings a distinct specialty set in the critical areas of employee engagement, leadership development, and member loyalty strategies. She has helped hundreds of business leaders and young professionals through her coaching, mentoring, and professional development efforts. Angela delivers a highly valued perspective of how to help business drive growth and optimize their future success Having spent 20 years as a leader at uh, CUNA, a uh, credit union national association, as well as the past year fostering credit union growth through CU Difference. She is an active credit union development educator, building on the credit union industry's people helping people philosophy. Without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and kick it over to Angela. Thank you so much, Papa Andy. Great to see you. Great to see all of you here with us today. Good to see some friendly faces in the crowd. I can't chat back to you, Nancy, but I see you there. So thank you very much. Welcome, welcome to Creating Extraordinary Customer Experiences. It's not a secret that sometimes we get ourselves into a situation where we're not feeling the best about whatever's happening in our world. It can be something as simple as, mm, I don't know, the first day at work. This is a picture of my office, my first job right out of college. Okay, it's not really my office, but I swear that when they were prepping for me to get there, Everyone that had been there more than, I don't know, more than I had, more than two weeks, raided that office. So I ended up with the chair that was all nasty and ratty. Um, one wheel didn't work, so it was kind of like off kilter a little bit. I had the circa 1950-something desk that was all metal, like a war-era desk. And literally, my supervisor said to me, oh, you're here. I didn't think you were starting today. And I was like, hey, thanks. Glad to you know that I'm coming. And he sat me down at this desk right across from his office. And he said, I want you to read these binders. And it was the National Electric Code. Wow. It was gas codes and it was water manuals because it was a utility company. Oh my God. Thank goodness for that company that I didn't have a cell phone because this was back in the day. I'm old. Don't judge. But I would have I would have been texting my friend saying, what am I doing? I made a huge mistake because this is horrible. So after about, oh, I don't know, two weeks, they finally got the hang of the fact that I was there. Really? Can you imagine? Now, contrast that with my first day at a job that I want to say gave me the best first impression. Working at CUNA, Credit Union National Association, 
I got a welcome letter and a package in the mail that had a book that they had published on the history and philosophy of the credit union movement with a welcome note, handwritten welcome note from my new boss saying, we're so excited you're starting. Thanks for accepting this position. If you get some time, read through this and you'll know a little bit more about the credit union industry and the credit union movement before you even get, get here. And at first I thought, well, okay, I'm, you're not paying me. I'm not going to read it. But then, you know, whatever. It got the better of me and I did read it. And it was really fascinating history. But I got to work. My boss met me at the front. I had my own business cards and notepads with my name on my desk. Um, I spent a couple of hours in HR getting all that paperwork filled out because, you know, you got to love the HR people. Then when lunchtime came, my immediately my immediate um, group, my team, we all went out for lunch together. And then my boss took me around the department. There were about 35 people in the department. And we stopped at every single person's desk. I was welcomed as a new employee. I didn't feel like I was interrupting. I felt that they were genuinely happy that I was there. And I also got a to-do list from my boss that included things. Now, I didn't even know what my job was at that point. So I'm like, a to-do list. This is kind of weird. But the to-do list was things that I would absolutely succeed at. Like, take a look at the um, Office Depot catalog and order yourself the file type that you like. And, you know, set up your office. And here are some emails of people that I want you to introduce yourself. So it was so easy. And I left that first day feeling accomplished, feeling welcomed, feeling like I belonged. So think about that one as we go through. Now I'm going to switch over and I'm going to switch to the customer experience that I had. So that was an employee experience example. Customer experience wise, when I bought my first home, let me just tell you, this is not a picture of my family. They are just a very um, friendly, happy uh, group that uh, bought a home. So yeah. Anyway, I went into my local financial institution and I had a check in my hands for the proceeds from selling my first home. It was a check for $30,000, $30,000, more money than I had ever seen in my life, probably more money than I'll ever see again. Anyway, so I went up to the teller window. I'd filled out the little slip, handed it to the teller, and she asked me one question. She said, Would you like this deposited into your checking account or your savings account? And I said my checking account, got my little deposit ticket, went off the next day. And I think about that later and I'm thinking, you know, there's a ton of things she could have asked me to see if there was more help that they could have given me with my new home. Now, I did go off and I financed my my second home with another financial institution the next day. So they completely lost that business. And, and I've had people say, you know what, you're not going to get that business. You're, you know, 24 hours away from closing. It's not like that. Financial was going to win your business away. However, they could have won the fact that I I had a completely different layout in my new home. I needed furniture. Do you think that financial could have given me a loan for that? Um, I was buying a home that was new to me um, in a newer neighborhood, even though it wasn't brand new. And it had those builders, builder steps going down to the back patio. Those, you know, rickety ones that they basically hammer together some two by fours. And you're like, whoa, am I going to fall? I needed a new deck. Do you think they could have helped me with the deck? So there were all these opportunities that this person missed because she didn't engage me in any kind of conversation. She didn't look to have an elevated experience with me about what was going on in my life. So let's talk about how we can change that. First, get your fingers warmed up. We're in Wisconsin. I know there are people from all over. Um, We woke up this morning to 13 below zero temperature, and I don't even know what the wind chill was, but anytime the temperature is in the minus, it's cold. How do you, in the chat, tell me, how do you define your customer experience? 
And I'm going to give you some options here. Do you think the customer experience is how the customer sees you as a service provider? Or is it, is that customer experience made up of how the interactions that you have with that customer through your whole team? Or is the customer experience all the different interactions they have with all the different channels that you have, like your website and the phone and email? Or is the customer experience how you deliver on your mission on a day to day? So tell me in the chat, in the comments there, how are you defining the customer experience? And while you're thinking about how you define your customer experience, think also about who creates that customer experience. So I see Lisa is saying that the customer experience for her is feeling seen. So think about in your organization, now whether you are in a financial or whether you're in retail, it doesn't matter. Excellent. Thank you, Troy. Customer experience is making me want a relationship with them, and it can be anything. It's about how they make you feel. Nailed it. It's all of those things, just like Troy said. It's what Lisa said as well. It's experiences that we create as employees of said company, and it's how that customer sees us. Are we living our mission and vision? Are we consistent from channel to channel? Are we consistent from branch to branch or store to store, location to location? So the experiences that we de deliver to our customers or our members, if we're talking about credit unions, are defined by us. And they can really range from truly negative to amazingly positive. Let's keep going forward. Now that we're kind of level setting on what we mean by our customer experience, let's look at the average customer experience within a, within a business. I call it being whelmed. You're not overwhelmed. You're not underwhelmed. You're whelmed. So I prepped Papa Andy to come on the line and tell us a story, if you will, Papa Andy, about a favorite road trip that you had. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think back to, I think I was in eighth grade um, and I, uh, we, we took, my, my parents and my brother and I, we took a trip out to Utah and we did some, uh, some UT being out there, stayed in the cabin, uh, went to Bryce Canyon, Zion National Park. So it was a really fun, um, out West adventure. Nice. Excellent. So, um, Andy, I don't know if you had a station wagon or a minivan or what you had, yeah, but Ford Explorer. Nice. <laughs> Excellent. Um, at any point, do you remember, was the road smooth? At some points. Yeah. I think when we got to Colorado in particular, it was kind of windy. Nebraska. I don't know. That was a long time ago. Right? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And that's the whole point. Thank you, Andy. I appreciate yeah. you sharing your story. Yeah. So if you drive down a road with no potholes on it, like we've got on our screen, like maybe Papa Andy experienced, there's no potholes. It's nothing exciting happening. You're not you know, excited enough to be like, wow, everybody, I'm going to tweet everybody and put it on Facebook. Here's a picture of the road we were on. It was so smooth. Really? Nobody does that. You're also not annoyed enough to be like, Ugh. well, although if Andy had gone through Nebraska and hit a giant pothole and there was a section of the road that was really, really bad and it forced them off the road and they lost a tire and it became a whole story that you would have remembered, right? That becomes a different sort of experience. So, but overall, you don't get home thinking, wow, that was a smooth road, right? You are, you're thinking about what else is happening in your life. 
Now think about another area that we're whelmed in very often. You pull out your phone and you're ready to text someone and your text goes through. Now, if you've been camping in the middle of nowhere in Bryce Canyon or someplace where there's no cell signal, you might be excited that it goes through. But for the most part, you're not ecstatic that it went through. It's whelming. You got a text, your phone vibrated. You care more about that message and who it's from and somebody loves you and you've got a friend and ugh, I have a text. It's like the old you've got mail. You're not overwhelmed by the fact that things work they were the way they were supposed to work on the phone. And yes, I do realize that these are all flip phones that people have in their hands. And I kept this here because it just, it makes me laugh that they're all flip phones. This is even BT before you could text. So when you first got your phone though, you might've been excited. Ooh, cool. I can text somebody, right? What if we want to create this kind of reaction from our customers? If we do, we need to start building peaks with them. All right. So I mentioned in the description that we were going to talk about journey mapping. So with journey mapping, what you do is you think about every single step that a customer takes with you in order to get to whatever that service is or product is or whatever it is that you deliver. So when I journey map, what I'm doing is I'm solving problems. Typically, I'm looking for the potholes, right? But the best I can expect with a filled pothole is somebody who's whelmed. Troy is saying that uh, his his grandma shared a picture of a road that was a different color. So that was, see, that was fun. That was something different. That was a flat road, flat road, flat road, flat road, right? That was a something a little bit different. But think about the day-to-day. -day, what ways your um, customers, your members interact with you, whether it's depositing a check, whether it's returning an item to your store, whether it's buying something with a credit card. Those are all pretty mundane experiences. So when we're talking about this type of journey mapping, what we're talking about is what would a mundane experience look like along the, right, the way? And what would, whoa, a curveball look like? What would excellent service look like? What would something out of the ordinary look like for us? Okay, so when you're building memories, I know my friend Nancy is on the phone with us and she has been my guinea pig in the past to talk about all of her many, many trips to Disney, Disneyland, Disney World. Nancy, have you been to Euro Disney or is there another one? There's one in, um, I don't know where the other one is. There's a fourth one. Anyway, so think about the last time you took a major vacation. If I was telling a story about the time I went to Disney, here's what I remember about it. I was, I believe in ninth grade. So Andy, similar, similar timing to you. And we park, you know, 150 miles away because my dad didn't want to be the first in line because he was convinced that somehow there was this massive push when the parks first opened and then somehow there'd be this big gap. So we missed, you know, two or three hours of being in the park because my dad had to wait, whatever. Anyway, so I remember that part. But here's what I remember even more. We walked through the first, the front gate. Now, let me tell you, my dad was an assistant principal at one of the uh, middle schools, or it was a junior high school at the time, in the town I grew up. Everywhere we went with him, he knew somebody. So it was like, okay, we're at... Disney World in Florida, where there are tens of thousands of people. We walk through the front gate. We hear, Mr. Prostel. We're like, are you serious, Dad? Everywhere we go. Sure enough, it was a fellow teacher friend and his kids, and it was spring break, and so everybody was all down at Disney. And I'm like, of all the juke joints in all the world, you got to show up in mine. So anyway, that's one of the things I remember about Disney. What I don't remember is how long did we wait in any of the lines? 
What I don't remember is what was the average temperature and was it hot and humid or was it nice and balmy? I don't remember if anybody pitched a fit. I mean, you know, you're always supposed to be happy at Disney because it's the happiest place on earth, right? But I remember some big standout moments. Chip and Dan Heath and their book, The Power of Moments, call those um, peak and end moments. You remember something really good or really bad that's happened, and then you remember the end of the trip. So that's the peak end rule. So how does that apply to us? When we're creating moments, there are some things that we can do that kind of blow people away. Yes, I agree, Nancy, that Disney's attention to detail is amazing. They have hundreds of thousands of people keeping things going. Take a look at that picture on the slide, though. This, my friends, is one of the top rated hotels on TripAdvisor in Los Angeles, California. Now, think about how many hotels do you think are in Los Angeles, California? The only properties that rank better on TripAdvisor are, think, are properties like the Hotel Bel Air and the Four Seasons Beverly Hills and the Beverly Hills Hotel. So look at that. It doesn't look like a whole lot. It doesn't really look like much, does it? Maybe it's the pool. It's got to be the pool. Look at that pool. I could do a lap. It's got chairs. Look at it. Six chairs, no waiting. It's got that pole long thing that if I drown, you can help me out. So it's got to be the pool, right? Yeah. No, this pool isn't that amazing. Well, maybe it's maybe it's the rooms. You think it's the rooms? Wow. Look at the rooms. They did that little karate choppy thing with the pillow. I mean, who does that, right? It's got two matching table lamps that are circa 1964. It's got a window that you can barely see out of. It's not the rooms, folks, that are giving it these amazing, amazing ratings. Here's one of the things that they do. This hotel is called the Magic Castle. They create moments for their guests. There is a red phone by the pool called the Popsicle Hotline, as you can see. You pick it up. You don't even have to dial a number. You pick it up and someone answers it saying, Popsicle Hotline. You can order orange, grape, cherry popsicles, and someone brings them out dressed in full business attire with white gloves, and they have their popsicles on a silver tray, and they bend down to you at the pool, and they hand you a free popsicle, free. This doesn't get charged to your room. It is free, right? It gets hot in LA by the pool. What's more refreshing than a free popsicle? And look at the height of that phone. The attention to detail there is amazing because it's at kid height. So kids know Popsicle Hotline, heck, I'm going to pick this up. I'm going to make this phone call. But it's even more than that. They have a snack menu. And take a look at some of these things. Now, I know that this is a little bit wonky. Um, it's I don't have a, a picture of the actual menu. This is the menu, but it's taken from, it's a screen grab. So, so their snack menu, I mean, think of that. Cheetos, Doritos, chocolate chip cookies, Coke, Pepsi, cream soda, root beer, all the things. This is all free just for the asking. You can also look at the bottom, free laundry service. You can drop off your laundry and they're, they're going to wash it, fold it, and put it back in your room, leave it at the foot of your bed in a brown paper package tied up with string with a little sprig of lavender. Somebody can start singing if you want. They've got a board game menu. There's a movie menu. And they don't charge for any of this stuff. You can borrow all of it for free. There's a magician in the lobby a couple of times a week all for free. So now you're starting to get an idea of why this is the number six hotel out of nine, 392 hotels in LA. Number six ranked. And I checked this recently. They're up there. So now 
again, if we look back at our steps in our journey, if I've got six steps, what am I going to do to create a special moment? What am I going to do to create a popsicle hotline moment? or give a snack away. Now, most of us, if we've got businesses that are open, we've done away with any kind of snacks, any kind of water or coffee, any of that kind of stuff, because people aren't supposed to be taking their masks off. So what else can we do to make people feel like, man, we're connecting with them? I'm going to keep this rolling in the back of your head. We'll keep coming back to these uh, different mini journey maps. But remember, we're talking about a, a, a typical journey wherever you work. So if I'm depositing a check, if I'm returning an item, if I'm using a credit card, whatever it happens to be, how can we create a special moment? All right, next up, resolving problems. When you work in customer service, something's going to go wrong. At some point, something will go wrong, right? It, best intentions, um, we may be trying to avoid problems everywhere we turn, but something's going to go wrong at some point. So we need to have a plan to resolve problems. My favorite example is a very famous story about Joshi the giraffe um, at the Ritz-Carlton. What happened was a father and their family family was vacationing at a Ritz Carlton and the young boy had a stuffed giraffe named Joshy, Joshy the giraffe, if you didn't catch that. And Joshy got left behind in the room. So the dad panicked. The kid was beside itself. And the kid was just like, I, I need Joshy back. We have to go back. We need to fly back to the hotel and get Joshy. So just like in the Grinch, the dad thought up a line. He thought it up quick. He said, you know what? Joshy just wanted to extend his vacation. So he's taking an, an extra long vacation. I'm sure he'll be back one of these days. Meantime, he's frantically emailing and calling the hotel saying, help. My kid lost his giraffe. Hopefully you can find it somewhere in your lost and found. I told him he was taking an extended vacation and that he would come back. I will pay anything to get this giraffe back. Well, the person in loss prevention took that story and ran with it. Not only did he find Joshi, but he was like, okay, this giraffe is taking a vacation at our hotel. What do you do when you're on vacation? Well, obviously you sit by the pool with your sunglasses on, right? What else do you do if you're staying at a fancy Ritz Carlton? You get a massage. You go golfing. And in this case, Joshua was even able to be behind the scenes in security and run some of the cameras and the security equipment. And they made Joshi his own security badge. He was part of loss prevention for this hotel. The hotel staff had a blast doing this because they knew what the story was. And they actually took all of these pictures. They put them in a little Ritz Carlton scrapbook. They put a note with it saying, sorry, I've been gone so long. Um, I had a great time. Here are some of the adventures I've had while I've been gone. And they sent that back to the child with Joshi and, you know, with the, the scrapbook. Okay. So the package arrives at the house. What happens? Does the little kid go, oh, cool. I want to see this scrapbook. The little kid goes, I could care less about the scrapbook, right? The kid just wanted Joshy home and was ecstatic and ran away and completely forgot that Joshy had been lost. Guess who that scrapbook was targeted at? Who do you think that hotel staff was targeting when they, they put that scrapbook together? Tell us in the chat. Because here's what happened. That staff at the Ritz-Carlton, yeah, it's the parents. Hi, Andrea. It's the parents. The parents were the ones that made the decision to go to that hotel. Um, 
the parents were the one who made up the story. The dad kind of made up that story, right? So they did him a solid by corroborating his story. And this nails what we're talking about when we're resolving problems, but we're elevating them. Guess who decides where the next vacation is? It's not Jashi the giraffe, and it's not the little kid. It's the parents, even though the kid sort of feels like they've got something to do with it. So talk about building loyalty. Exactly, just like you said, Nancy. As an aside, I know we're not talking Ritz-Carlton principles here, but did you know, hopefully you're sitting down as you're watching this, did you know that the Ritz-Carlton gives every staff person $2,500 per guest per day to resolve problems? What? Because here's the thing, that security person who took that call, the person in loss prevention, they shouldn't have to make a call to a supervisor saying, hey, this dad just called. Here's what I'm kind of thinking about doing. I'd like to, you know, um, set him by the pool and get some sunglasses and make, make it seem like he's golfing and all these things and make him a badge. I think it's going to cost about this much for the scrapbook and it's going to. No, he just was able to do it because he had the money and he had the, the empowerment to make that difference for that family. Here's the thing though, there's a limit to what you can be doing for your, your customers to resolve problems. There was actually a story that isn't very famous. It's not as famous as Joshi the giraffe where um, there was a case of mistaken identity and someone at the front desk um, Let's just say they called someone who wasn't someone's wife, um, Mrs. whatever the guest name was. That was bad, right? Without thinking about it, the front desk clerk said, I'm so, so sorry. You know what we're going to do? We're going to comp your entire stay for you. Without looking at anything, without look, checking the reservations or anything. So they ended up comping this person's stay. That person stayed for seven days at a Ritz Carlton. Holy cow, it cost the hotel a ton of money. So did that person get reprimanded for spending too much money? They had a conversation with their boss. And instead of saying, you know, bad on you, you made a huge error. The conversation instead was, what else could we have done to make it up to this customer that this guest that we you know, had a mistake. So they didn't get in trouble for spending the money, but they did think about it the next time and thought, okay, how can I be creative in solving the problem without costing as much money, if that makes sense. So yeah, it is a crazy amount for customer satisfaction, Andrea. Um, most of us can't afford that kind of a thing. But then again, most of us aren't as ritzy as the Ritz, if you will, right? But now think about this. How are you going to resolve problems? When we're talking about a problem, it's a pothole. And again, as I mentioned, when you're filling a pothole, the most you can expect is someone who is whelmed. Great. It was a smooth road. So think about in this particular scenario, for your customers, your members, the people who visit your business, when you resolve problems for them, what would create a memorable experience? So evaluate the typical area, areas where your customers hit potholes and think about how can I elevate that? How can I, I anticipate the potholes so I can fill them, but how can I also make that pothole, I'm calling it a pothole, a more memorable experience? Let's keep going. Next up, we look at elevating experiences. So research shows that we tend to focus on um, the pothole experience for our members. We focus so much on resolving problems. And so then we focus on the most unhappy customers we have, right? So if I have a customer and I ask them to fill out uh, customer satisfaction sheet, the smile sheet, just like you see on your screen. And I've got a scale of zero to 10. 
which is a little bit flipped. Usually I think 10 is the best. Anyway, so um, I had a very, very poor experience, right? What ends up happening is we spend a ton of our time focusing on improving the experiences for the folks who selected a seven, eight, nine, or 10. They're the ones that are yelling the loudest. They're the ones that are screaming at us. What if instead we focused on making the people who already like us fall in love with us just a little bit more? So moving just a small percentage of our top customers further into the green, that is going to open up a world to us. Not only will our satisfaction scores go up, but guess what? Our revenue goes up too because you've got someone who already loves you, someone who's already happy with you, already spending money with you, and you make them even happier. All right, so think about it another way. What if I spend my time and energy, someone who has given us an eight? I spend time, energy, money, resources, making things right for them. The most I might do is move them from bad to okay. Wow, that's a lot of work to get to okay. I'm not going to get them to excellent or great unless I comp their entire stay at the Ritz. And is it really worth that money? What if in instead I spent my energy, my time, my money, my staff resources, focusing on the people who are at a four, who think I'm pretty good? And I get them to focus on moving from good to great, a number two on the list, right? Mind blown. Now, good to great is another book. It's another talk. It's another day. We're not going to talk about good to great, but we are going to talk about elevating our experiences for our customers. So back in the day, back in the way back machine, we filled out all of our forms by hand. That's an accounting sheet that you see in the first, um, first uh, circle on the left. Then someone had a bright idea and they said, let's use a typewriter to make filling things out even easier. Let's maybe invent carbon paper so we can make two copies at once. We get better and better and better and we create more and better experiences for ourselves and for our, our employees and for our customers. Secret here, the typewriter that's on the right, that Smith Corona, that was the first typewriter that I ever got that I took with me to college. <laughs> yes, it was before computers. Don't judge. I'm old. Whatever. I made a lot of money typing up uh, papers for people because it had a super secret key. It had an autocorrect tape. So it was the, the black ink, but then it was white tape underneath it. So if you hit the special correcto key, it would remember the last character you typed and it would backspace, it would white out that character and then let you type over it. First time I, I saw it, I was like, this thing is magical whatever. It wasn't magic, but it was the best we had at the time, right? But our, our experiences kept elevating. So my first real job, again, I was in my closet with my wobbly chair. This is my portable computer. Now, I don't have a picture of my actual port portable computer, but this is it. This, I was able to find a picture on the internet. I thought it was hot stuff. Because everywhere I went, I could take my 40-pound computer, yes, 40 pounds, that you'd kind of be lilting to one side and slamming it against your leg, right? It used two five-and-a-quarter-inch floppy disks, um, which some of you on the call probably don't even know what a disk is, a floppy disk, let alone the five-and-a-quarter, because they were replaced by three-and-a-half-inch floppies. Anyway, I'm again, I'm old. Don't judge. The price for this back in the day was $3,000, which it was the equivalent today of about $7,500 for something that had a screen that was about this big. I think it was a four by five screen. It was monochromatic. It was orange, as you can see on the screen. It um, basically, you could type basic things in it and that's it. But here's the cool part. The keyboard that you see in front, you actually 
could put that keyboard over the screen and over the floppy drives and screw it down, that became how it was portable, right? Craziness. But again, it was an elevated experience. I was cool. I had, I wasn't going to say a laptop. It wasn't a laptop. I had a portable computer. So that's where PCs came from because they were portable computers. Now, look at what people are doing to elevate even further. In the chat, tell me what do you think this represents? And my friend Nancy, I know you've been in this session before, so don't give it away. And yes, Troy, you're right. The three and a half inches were, were not floppy disks. The five and a quarter were bendable, but the other disks had little plastic on them to keep them from flopping. So what do you think this is, this space? Nancy knows. Take a guess. I was going to say there are no right or wrong answers, but there is a right and wrong answer. All right. Lisa thinks it's a system of some kind, like a computer system room. What else? What do you think this might be? It looks fancy. It's pretty sleek, right? Pretty art. Yes, it's very artistic. This is actually a coffee shop in Milan. Those individual different, um, I'm going to call them, I don't know, they look like lockers, but each one of them represents different flavoring and things that you can add to your drink. And no, they're not hot dog condiments. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. All right, what about this one? What do you think this is? And I'm going to I'm going to give you a little hint here because Troy you you were pretty close with what you just said. And yes Troy I will book a flight to Milan with you anytime. What do you think this is? It looks kind of nice. It's kind of sleek. Kind of fancy. Yeah. Is it a hotel breakfast buffet? Is it a bar or bakery in a hotel? It's it's a little bit of that. Julie says it's at an airport. Hi, Julie. How are you? Um, this is actually, well, it's sort of all of the above and none of the above. This is a crate and barrel store in Chicago. It literally is the store. What they do is they know that the people who are shopping in Crate and Barrel kind of have a, a weird obsession with Crate and Barrel. I do anyway. It's like the container store. You go in and you just are like, my house and my life could look like this. What they know is that, I mean, they know that people like the design of their dishes, their glasses, their silverware, all their things. No, this is not my kitchen. Um, <laughs> But what better way to showcase all of the cool things that Crate and Barrel has to offer than using them actually in a restaurant? P.S. I get my um, fruit cup, I don't know, in a little ramekin. Who knows what a ramekin is? Guess what I'm going to do as soon as I'm done eating? I'm going to go buy myself some ramekins. So it's a great way to cross sell their products by showing them being used, by showing them in action. So really elevating the experience because if I sell kitchen supplies, why wouldn't I want to give, give you a look at kitchen supplies? All right, let's go back to our journey mapping. Again, we've got our step one through step six or however many steps we've got. And we've got different customer service experiences along the way, whether we're buying something, we're depositing a check, whatever it happens to be. Think about in your industry, your customer service experiences. What if like on that top picture, rather than having a traditional cashier line, someone goes and meets you with a square, a little card reader right in the middle of the store when they know you're ready to go. You can check out your purchases and you don't have to wait in any line. That could elevate, right? 
Or maybe you've got some kind of a design firm. Maybe you've got a kitchen design center, or maybe you've got, um, you do playgrounds and decks and swimming pools and all that kind of stuff. That bottom picture, what if that was a virtual reality of this dude out by his pool, catching a beer from his buddy because he's looking at himself at the pool? How cool would that be, right? He's already primed. His buddy's throwing him a beer. He's ecstatic because he can see himself at that pool. So now thinking about this for you, how are you elevating your experiences and how can you elevate your experiences even further? Next up in our journey mapping is breaking the script. So how can we break the script for our customers? We know we have to create peaks. We know we're going to try and uh, um, create those special moments for our customers along the way. We're going to we're going to um, elevate those experiences for them, right? But we have to do something that is. Um, if we elevated for every single customer that comes in, it becomes expected rather than something special. So we don't want to create something so frequent that it becomes expected. We need to think about breaking the script for by creating little surprises and little moments, if you will, for our customers or for our coworkers. So if I'm going to break the script, take, for example, um, the art of recognizing our customers or our coworkers. Uh, not recognizing in, hey, I know you, I can recognize you, but recognizing them for doing good work or recognizing milestones. What if you sent a card to them just because? Or what if you had a cadence where you looked at not just the milestones, like um, if I was going to celebrate somebody's birthday and I'm going to send them a card, that could be something that's expected. But if my company's never done it before, maybe that is outside the box thinking. Think again. So what if I have a car loan and I've got a five-year car loan? Man, five years feels like forever right now, doesn't it? What if I got a card from my credit union saying, congratulations on being one year into your five-year car loan. Hope it's still working out for you, for you. Let us know if there's anything else we can do at, that, at the credit union. Totally random, totally out of the blue, totally broke the script for me. What if for my coworkers, what if I've got someone who's made their first sale? The first sale is always celebrated. Well, okay, hopefully it's always celebrated. What if I had a system that flagged when people made their 100th sale or their 1,000th sale, and I celebrated that instead. How cool would that be? How much would that break the script? Because they're not expecting it. What if it's, um, say it's our 75th anniversary, so the 75th person that comes into my store the week of my 75th anniversary gets a little something, something. I don't know what it is. So you get the idea, breaking the script, making those little surprises and those little memorable moments, not so much rote that we see them time and time again, but something that just for one person makes their day. Here's an idea. What if you started to say thank you? a little bit more frequently and a little bit more personally. Oh my gosh, Nancy, I love that thought. I just saw it. What if you gave Valentine's to your coworkers that state something that you love watching them do at work because they're so good at it? I love it. Something specific that you catch them doing that's good. How often are we only told when we're doing something that's bad? Think about this now. What if... We have a major project. To, okay. We have a major project that ends. Everybody celebrates it. But we have many projects that happen all the time, right? What ends up happening is we get on this little treadmill. We get on the hamster wheel of project work. So one project finishes, but the other one is already going. And they just keep happening one after the other. And nobody's celebrating anymore because nothing is special. 
something happens to our sense of pride and our sense of worth when we're not celebrated and when we're not appreciated. There are things that get in the way of celebrating our coworkers, celebrating our staff, celebrating our customers. So yeah, big projects we celebrate, but even those small projects need to be celebrated. If you feel that you need to do a, a better job of recognizing your coworkers, when I've been talking to people along the way, most often what I hear is people say, I got busy. I had a lot of other things on my plate. I just, you know, I know that my team is made up of really high functioning, amazing people. And so they don't need to be recognized. If you go back and rewatch this, you'll hear me say the word I. I got busy. I didn't have time. I had another project. My team is so good. I don't have to recognize them. So what if instead we flip the script and break that script and we start to focus instead of on ourselves, on others. I now focus on Andy and what an amazing job he's doing in putting out some of the best content that we've seen and it's all free because of Dream Bank. Here's a tool that I love to use. Take a piece of paper, blank piece of paper and across the top, actually turn it sideways, across the top, start building yourself a table and write down the names of groups that you either work with or that you play with or that you pray with, whatever it happens to be. So it might be family, it might be best friends, it might be coworkers, it might be your team, it might be your curling club, it could be, I don't know, you know, whoever <laughs> that's in your, your, your circle of influence. So all of those groups. Now, in those groups, write down the first name of all of the important people to you in those groups. So I've got my group names across the top, and now I've got people's names down in columns. That becomes my template for recognition. Now what I do is once a week, I set myself a 15 minute appointment. It can be Tuesdays at two. It can be Fridays at four. It can be Mondays at, there's no hour that starts with an M. It could be Mondays whenever I want to. Set a recurring appointment for once a week for 15 minutes with yourself. At that time, get out some note cards. Doesn't matter what the note cards say. They can be just picture note cards. And review your list. Scan the columns. And think about, has someone done something over the past week that makes you say, you know what? You made my life just a little bit easier this past week or this past month. You deserve a thank you card. And right then and there, in that 15 minutes, write your thank you note, address it, stamp it, and get it gone. If it's a coworker, send it to their home address if you're able to find their home address. Because guess what will happen? Do you think your coworker is the only one that's going to see that note? No, they're going to show it to everybody they know. They're going to maybe even put it on Facebook. Nancy sent me a card just because? How cool is that, right? If you live with them, it's harder to send them a card. But how cool would that be to get a surprise? Because guess what? You know their address. Send your kid a card saying, I'm proud of you for making it through virtual learning like a champ. So when you look at your list on your once a week basis, don't just send a card because you think you have to. It could be an email. It could be a phone call. You could set up a Skype meeting. But there's something about getting a handwritten note that just, I don't know, it makes your heart sing because you know there's a little extra effort involved in finding the stamp and finding your address and all that kind of good stuff. So I tend to like the cards. Plus, it's tangible and you show it around. You probably don't very often show people an email that you get. Anyway, if you look at your list at the end of your week or whenever your appointment is and you go, you know what? Nobody really did something for me this week. Don't send it. Don't send a note because if you do, you're going to look fake. 
So only do it when somebody is really, really special. All right. So now it is your turn, my friends. How will you create memories or create moments rather? How will you resolve problems? How will you elevate experience, experiences? And how will you break the script for your staff? Put it in the chat. If you've got something that you've done that you know has made a difference, share the love, share the ideas. Authentic notes are amazing. Sarah Buck says, I sent thank you cards to peers this last November as a just because, and it felt good sending them a personal message that wasn't a text or an email. And the response I got was so positive. That's phenomenal, Sarah. Thank you. And thank you for being here. So as you're thinking about this in the chat, I would love to hear what you're doing. And remember, the reality of customer service in almost any industry is that most of what we do is mostly forgettable by our customers. Grocery shopping, making service calls, depositing a check. It's not bad. It's just a flat road, right? It's whelming. It's not something that adds to the peak end rule. Occasionally though, we do something that's remarkable and it gets remembered and it gets tweeted and it gets shared. People are willing to forget a lot of average and a lot of being whelmed as long as there are some moments that are special. And it's up to you to create those special moments. Thank you very much for joining us. Keep typing in the chat because there's some amazing ideas coming in. And I've got my contact information up there. Um, please uh, follow me on, on Twitter and uh, connect with me on LinkedIn. I love it. Thank you so much for that, Angela. Um, it was wonderful to hear that and really kind of, you know, compare and contrast uh, my experiences, both working, you know, in, in customer service um, and then my experience uh, calling and, and, uh, and, you know, interacting with, with certain brands and organizations too. So um, wonderful, wonderful presentation. Very much appreciate you putting that together. Very insightful and, you know, obviously a true testament. Look at all these comments come in. Thank this last you. one right here uh, from Andrea, for me, uh, in the, the credit union setting, resolving problems during this, uh, actually just created a, a journey map when working with members on how to make better negative experiences positive. If I stay on this journey map, I think I can help these uh, members better. And I think that's nice. A, yeah, that's a great, great takeaway here. Excellent. Um, Go ahead. We'll, we'll take a few more moments here. If you do have any uh, questions for Angela, obviously her contact information is up there. If you would like to get in contact with her after the uh, the event is done. Um, again, I want to thank uh, thank you all for tuning in today. Again, thank you, Angela, for, for putting this together. Um, we really try and, and uh, um, you know, are, are very intentional about the the content that we put out and, and uh, you know, hope that you uh, uh, find value in that. Um, if there's anything that you feel is uh, is missing or that you would like to see, please go ahead and reach out to to us here just on Facebook. You can shoot Dream Bank a message. I'll go ahead and I'll take a peek at that and do our best to, to try and tailor that as we uh, continue to hunker down through uh, this winter and uh, working from home uh, with this pandemic. Um, lots of wonderful praise coming in uh, for, for you here as well, Angela from Sarah. Thank um, you. <laughs> reading some of these comments from Lisa. Uh, it's wonderful. Um, you know, there's, there's nothing else that's coming in. So I think we'll go ahead and cap it there. Hi, Zoe. <laughs> um, so what, what Lisa's referring to is Disney has a phrase called, it's not our fault, but it is our problem. So when you're in a parking lot at Disney, if you lose your car, because those parking lots are massive, um, everyone in that is helping, um, park cars marks down on a map about what time they're parking different sections. So when you come back out of the park, all you have to do is ask somebody, you know, I need help finding my car. They'll say, what time did you get here? Oh, about 10 o'clock. They'll say, well, we were parking in Goofy 3 at that point, <laughs> and they'll help you get to your car. Anyway, that's what she's referring to. That's awesome. Yeah, I didn't know. It's been a while since I've been to, to Disney World. So yeah. but, uh, thanks for sharing that, Lisa. Uh, yeah, try, I'm try, try my best. It's it's uh, it's a work in progress, but we're, we're getting there. So 
Um, again, thank you all for, for tuning in today. Thank you, Angela. We'll go ahead and cap it there and we will see you all next time. Thank you so much.